PWS, of course, there are many related disorders, and especially chromosome 15 in that region has got a lot of stuff going on. So there's a syndrome called duplication 15 syndrome, where that whole region is replicated an extra time. Um, and those individuals um, can have some autism, they can have some behavioral uh, features, and they can have some intellectual disabilities. Um, and, and it's really important to understand that group and how it relates to PWS, because in some ways, PWS uh, by uniparental disomy has some of the same features genetically and also characteristic wise. So Dr. Ryder really comes at it from, he, he works on all of these 15Q uh, syndromes that are related to PWS, and so having that perspective to understand PWS uh, can be really helpful as well. So we're uh, excited to have him uh, come talk about uh, the, the cells that he's been driving from your kid's teeth and what they show. <laughs> All right, thanks again for having me here. Um, and it's appropriate to be in an audience full of people who have made this research possible because you've made this research possible because I couldn't do it without teeth from your kids. Um, and I think that's one of the things that drew me to this project. Um, I haven't always worked on dental pulp stem cells, but it's nice to know that we, we send the families a tube and, and some forms and they get very excited about being part of the research and have gone over and above what we've asked them to do for the most part. And so now we have, and I don't know if I specifically mention it, but we have 23 Prater Willie lines frozen um, that we do research on. So that's pretty good. Um, I don't know if we expected that, <laughs> that many in such a short period of time. So that was almost a year, something like that. But keep them coming, that doesn't mean you can stop. All right, so um, as mentioned, I'm at the University of Tennessee in Memphis, um, and I have been working for a long time um, on the chromosome 15Q region. In fact, I've been working so long that I remember Rob Nichols when I was a graduate student, and I went to talk <laughs> on imprinting. So it's, it's definitely been a while. Um, and what, uh, what, what, drew me to this field was, of course, the imprinting. I mean, it's kind of a fascinating mechanism. And what I think you guys um, should realize is that I don't just by accident work on all these different syndromes. It's really fascinating that they're all at the same spot and that it's the genetics that dictates which syndrome you end up with. If you get Angelman syndrome, duplication 15Q syndrome, or Prader-Willi syndrome, you know, you can get all of those from a recombination at exactly the same locus. One's a duplication, one's a deletion. So that's pretty interesting to me. Um, so I, I use this slide to show that although there's not um, necessarily that much in common between autism and Angelman syndrome, actually the most common form, um, the most common chromosomal rearrangement that you find if you just look in a cohort of autistic individuals is a duplication on chromosome 15. And so if you're going to understand autism, and I'll come back to this at the end, you may want to start with a syndrome where everybody has autism for the same reason instead of as many clinicians I see, I see Anastasia. She's nodding her head because if you've seen one kid with autism, you've seen one kid with autism is what they say, right? But if you've seen a kid with 15Q duplication syndrome, he actually has a defined, he or she, a defined molecular cause for that syndrome. So this is... Um, a rather complicated view of, of a complicated locus, and I'm afraid I won't be as good as Mark Leland at explaining this, but we'll, we'll go along with what we've got here. And I'd like to use the pointer, but I don't know which button to press, so I'm gonna go with the flow here. What button is it? Is it that one? Nah, that's all right. So uh, the little green brackets are around what we call the critical region in this locus. And that's where all the meat is, and we've been talking about this locus, although the other di diagrams were a little bit different from the uh, perspective of Prader-Willi syndrome. And what, what you guys probably know is that if you inherit a deletion of this region and you inherit it paternally, you'll get Prader-Willi syndrome. If you inherit a deletion from this region maternally, you get a different syndrome. You get Angelman syndrome. And Angelman syndrome is really um, where I started. And that's because I work on a protein called UBE3A, that's a ubiquitin ligase, which is expressed preferentially from the maternal allele in the brain. Um, and that loss of that expression is what causes Angelman syndrome. So why do these things go together? And this was touched upon a little bit, 
So if you, if you bear with me for a second, um, if you have the Angelman syndrome, you've lost UB3. You have no UB3 in neurons. You actually have UB3 in some other tissues because it's not imprinted in some other tissues, right? It's primarily imprinted in the brain. If you get Angelman syndrome from UPD, you have two paternal copies. And you can also get Angelman syndrome. You actually have a slightly milder phenotype than if you get the deletion. Then you get up into the normal range of UB3 expression. And then we jump up one step and we're in the Prader-Willi maternal UPDs. Now the reason they're up there is because as you go up, you, you lean more towards the autism spectrum. So with smaller interstitial duplications and larger isodicentric duplications, you get more and more chance of, of having an autism phenotype. And so in fact, the reason that I got involved in the Prader-Willi uh, cell lines is because I was really interested in this maternal UPD effect that two copies of the maternal chromosome, presumably with two functional copies of UB3A, is gonna increase your levels of UB3A and probably is the reason why those kids have a higher incidence of autism. So here's the data. This is actually part of the, the study that we've done. Um, and what we do is when we send the, the, the kits out, we send a test called the SCQ, the Social Communication Questionnaire. And if you look at our cohort of kids with UPD on the top, yes, yes. So you'll see that there's a significant um, uh, difference between the two groups there. You get a group of individuals who don't score autism on the SEQ and a, and a group of individuals who do. And there's a definite separation in scores. You've, you've, clearly there's a, a, an enrichment for autism. On the bottom, you'll see um, how many, I can't read from here, 12 um, Prader-Willi deletion cases. And in those 12 cases, nobody had autism. So we, we actually had nothing to compare the deletions to. So it was, a, it was a true enrichment just from doing the SEQ in these kids with UPD. So we're pretty confident that we're getting close to what we need, which unfortunately we're not quite to the point where we're ready to do large scale sequencing on these guys because we have four uh, affected, autism affected UPD cases and uh, we have enough unaffected, but we need probably six for us to go ahead and do the gene expression. So if you've, if you've got a child with UPD and you'd like to be part of the study, all they really have to do is have a loose tooth and you contact us and we'll send you the kit and it's all easy. It, you don't have to do very much except catch it right when it comes out if you can. <laughs> that helps a lot. So why are we catching teeth? What are we doing with them? Um, so many of you may not know, and I didn't know, um, that there was a, a really rich source of stem cells inside dental pulp. And in fact, the, the teeth that normally fall out, um, you know, the, the exfoliated teeth, are actually a really rich source of these stem cells, even better than adult teeth. And since the teeth are falling out anyway, we figured we might as well go for it and collect these teeth. And it's been very successful because it's fairly straightforward to take a tooth, when we get a tooth in the lab, to break it open and grow, we really just grow the cells that are in there and the stem cells take over the culture and they actually end up looking like this. So um, on the left side is a, a mostly confluent culture of dental pulp stem cells. Um, and they tend to look kind of like fibroblasts. They, they just spread out and flatten on the dish. On the right side, are DPSCs that we induce to become neurons. And you might not be able to see on phase contrast, but some of the cells have projections coming off of them and have a shape that looks kind of neuron-like. So to, to show you that better, we did some staining and it's a little more obvious when you look. On the left side, you see the DPSCs, they're sort of flat. And on the right side, you see these cells that start to look like neurons. But in this culture, we also have glial cells, and that's actually a pretty important point because your brain has glial cells in it too. So the, this is a mixed culture. It's not a pure culture of one type of neuron. It's a mixed culture of neurons that act and, and seem to be neurons, but it's, it's always gonna be really difficult to prove that they're the same as the ones that came out of you know, a brain. So um, what we figure here is that if we have the ability to collect enough DPSC lines will at least be able to approximate what happens to neurons in the disease state, 
versus controls, and that's really the goal. So um, the main goal of the grant, and I've, I've taken the aims out because I tried to make it so that we could talk a little more basic about it, um, was that we were gonna look at these DPSCs and try to do a technique called RNA-seq, which is to sequence all the genes being expressed and to look at individuals that had um, autism versus those that did not have autism but had the same type of Prader-Willi syndrome. They both had uniparental disomy. In addition, we want to look at kids with Prader-Willi syndrome deletion class versus control. So that's two different sets of experiments that we want to do RNA-seq on. And, um, We've been making some progress on this, and we did a pilot experiment I'm gonna show you some, some data for, um, where we did something called a microarray. In fact, we did two different types of microarrays. Um, instead of jumping right into the RNA-seq, which is tempting, but you don't wanna do if you don't have enough samples to really prove anything. <laughs> so um, we did a preliminary experiment with four deletion and four control, and I'm gonna show you some of that data. But I also am gonna show you some really, really recent data uh, from a collaboration with Dr. Stefan Stom uh, at the University of Kentucky, and we shared the, the cell lines with him, and in fact, we grew up the cells for him and did some experiments for him, and I'll show you why we're, why we're doing that and what we found. Um, so, as I said, uh, we haven't dug deep into the RNA-seq yet because we wanna wait until we have enough samples that we can prove differential expression, but, but four is probably enough for us to do the microarray and get an idea of what's going on. So, um, we did a combination of microarrays. We actually looked at mRNA expression, which is the code for the genes that codes for proteins, and we looked at something called miRNAs. I don't know if you know, guys know what miRNAs are, but those are called microRNAs, right? And microRNAs regulate a lot of things. So they're, they're really interesting because they regulate transcripts, and then the transcripts turn into proteins. So we wanted to know, is there a network here that we're missing of microRNAs and um, mRNAs that are changing in the Prader-Willi syndrome deletion case versus control. And in fact, we found some interesting things. So we found 68 transcripts that code for proteins uh, that definitely changed differentially between the, the Prader-Willi and control. And we found 230 microRNAs. So that's kind of overwhelming, right? You find all these microRNAs. Um, and I'm gonna show you how we what our approach was to dealing with all of these different data points and how we made sense of this. Um, so actually, what happened was I, I, I had all these microRNAs and I had to figure out how to make sense of it. So I, I found this tool that allows you to look at the combination of mRNAs and microRNAs. And the reason you'd wanna do that is you wanna see things that are correlated. If the miRNAs regulate the mRNAs, there should be a correlation. Right? And that's really what this program does. And I'll show you the output. So first, we'll talk about the 68 transcripts briefly. This is called a heat map, and really all you're supposed to see here is, if you look on the control side, you see four replicates, and on the Prader-Willi side, you see four replicates. And it looks like there's some genes that are upregulated and some genes that are downregulated. And that's really exactly what we wanted to see. Now, do we have a magic bullet in this list? Not really. Um, there's not really one single gene that comes up that really says, oh, this is the gene that's causing all the phenotypes. There are a couple things we expected to see that we saw, but you know, in general, this is not the be-all, end-all answer, nor is it an in-depth investigation of gene expression. That's why we wanna do the RNA-seq method. So now we, we look at a combination of the mRNAs and the microRNAs using this tool, and it at first seems like we made a mistake. <laughs> like, like it's, it's far too complicated. But the nice thing about this tool is that they know that this is a very complicated output that may or may not mean anything, and what they do is they, they, they squeeze the data a little bit more, and they put some conditions on the data, and they say, well, where are, the, where are there places where there's a transcript regulated by an miRNA putatively and also a transcription factor involved. So we have a nice little network of a transcription factor, a transcript, and an miRNA. And in fact, when you do that with this Prader-Willi data, you get a much tighter set of regulation. So this was really impressive. So what that big circle on the bottom is, if you look at the blue balls, those are all transcripts, protein encoding transcripts or transcripts in general. 
and the, the, uh, the light green balls are transcription factors, and smack in the middle is a single miRNA. So we went from 230 down to one really interesting miRNA. So the problem that we're left with is that that particular microRNA, just like almost 90% of them, has not been shown to regulate any of those transcripts. It's supposed to regulate those transcripts. So the, the next step requires that you actually show in a cell culture system, how most people do it, that this microRNA regulates that transcript. That's not the worst thing in the world to do, but it takes a little time and it's a little bit difficult. And you know, there's a lot of transcripts there. So we're in the process of beginning that step. And that's really the next step is to show that those relationships are real. And then we may be on to something. All right. So now we're, we're waiting to do RNA-seq. We're, we're looking for ways to do this validation. And at the prater willey meeting at the science conference, I met Stefan Stom, who is very interested in splicing, maybe more interested in splicing than he should be, because he's really, really interested in splicing. And his problem was that he didn't really have a human cell line he could work with. He was doing all of these experiments in sort of these common cell lines that everybody uses. Uh, SH5Y neurons and 293T cells. And so he was really excited that I had four Prater Willi and four control lines that we could use, that we could make neurons out of them and we could do some experiments. So we did. So um, here's a picture of Stefan Stom, in case you don't know him. And so he has this hypothesis that he's been working on, and we just submitted a, an NIH grant together that SNORD 116 is driving a lot of the phenotypes in the syndrome because it's, it's altering splicing. And he's showing and has shown, and I'll, I'll show you a little bit of data, that several transcripts are differentially spliced when you don't have SNORD-116 present. So that's really strong evidence that this could be the case. But then he goes a little further, and I'm going to show you at the end, he thinks he can replace SNORD-116 with an oligo, with a piece of DNA. All right. so. First things first, so uh, Stefan did an experiment where he used SH5Y cells and he knocked down SNORD-116. So this is the putative model for Prader-Willi syndrome. You knock it down in the cells, it's gone, something's going to change. When he did gene expression studies on those cells and then we compared it to the, to the microarray gene expression studies that we did, we actually found overlap. In fact, under really stringent conditions on the right, we found 13 transcripts that were in both data sets. And on less stringent conditions, we found about 440. So there's definitely overlap between what's changing in the cell line when we knock down SNORD-116. But what's really dramatic is the data that we just put in his grant. And that's, I'll have to walk you through this a little bit. So at the top on the left is the experiment we were talking about. He knocks down SNORD-116 in, in S5Y uh, neurons, these are like neuronal cells, and he sees changes in expression for a list of transcripts at the bottom, right? On the bottom, uh, below that, it says hippocampus, that's actually brain tissue, and it's Prader-Willi versus control, and he sees changes in expression for those same transcripts. On the right, those same transcripts in control, two control lines versus two Prader-Willi syndrome deletion lines from our DPSC neurons, he sees changes in those transcripts. So this is the part that we did together. I made the neurons and sent them to him. I sent him RNA, actually. And he did these um, RT-PCR experiments to show the presence or absence of those particular transcripts. And you know, lo and behold, everything is consistent. So at least for this set of transcripts, it looks like his theory is correct, and that in uh, Prader-Willi syndrome neurons, he gets the same effect as in the SH5Y cells when he knocks down SNORD-116. On the right side is a very, very preliminary experiment, like last week, okay? We had some neurons growing in the incubator for something else. These are actually duplication 15Q uh, DPSC neurons. But the whole point of the experiment was, if I take my oligo, and I put a, a, a label on it. In this case, it's a Psi3 label. It makes the oligo glow red. Can I get it into these neurons? And in fact, uh, it's a little hard to see under this lighting, but where, where there's um, 
red in the upper panel, you can also see by phase contrast there are neurons. And in fact, some of those little dots are actually going down the process. So they're not in random places. They're, they're definitely inside the cell. So the oligo is getting in. So now the, the next step is obviously if we get the oligo in, does the oligo alter gene expression for these transcripts that we've shown are changing when SNORD116 is not there. So I'm really excited about this, and we're gonna continue this collaboration. Um, but I'm gonna bring you back for one second to what got me into this. So this is a very difficult to read slide of a list of syndromes where autism is a component. And what I would like to do, and what I've been trying to do, is to collect enough of these lines so that we can attack the problem of autism from a different perspective. And if we understand at least some gene expression changes for individual syndromes where autism is present, I'm hoping that at some point a picture will emerge of consistency across these disorders where these set of five or 10 or 11 genes all change in every syndrome where a kid has autism versus no autism. And in fact, I highlight a couple of these here because right in the center, we have Angelman syndrome, prater willi syndrome, 15Q duplication syndrome. Um, but I now have cell lines for many of these disorders and we're in the process of building up the collection to where we can do sort of a, a massive NIH-funded study where we can start to look at commonalities among these different disorders where autism is a component. Okay, so one more advertisement slide. Um, and I didn't set my timer, but I hope I'm on time. Uh, if you want to contact me or if you just see me, I'll give you my card. The best way to contact me is by email. If you email me, then we can start the process of a conversation about the genetics report because I have to have a genetics report for me to go forward to send you a kit. It's part of our protocol. And so, you know, people get excited and they forget about it and then they call me, a tooth's coming out right now, <laughs> you know? Can I put it in milk? You know, they say all kinds of stuff. So I would like to tell this audience at least that I, I would love to get a genetics report. We'll send you a kit. You can keep the kit in the fridge. It's stable for a long time. That's the best way to do this, um, not Friday afternoon when it's finally coming out. You know, although we've succeeded with some of those, but it's, it's much easier if we start up front <laughs> with, a, with a kit. All right, so um, finally, I'm just gonna acknowledge a few people that worked on this, and uh, I definitely wanna thank the Pretty Really Research Foundation for not only funding the DPSC project, but getting me in a room with people like Stefan Stom and Anastasia, and like we've got a project going on. Like it, it, this has been a productive scientific exchange for me too. So I've, I've been very happy with this group. Um, and I've got a new student, Caitlin Victor, who is um, working exclusively on the dental pulp stem cells in my lab, and Kevin Hope, who works on flies. I'm not going to talk about that project. Um, and Marty Donaldson, who's a, a dentist at UT, who gets me all the controls I could ever want, so that's been great. Um, you know, he, he calls us up and we go over to the clinic and we get a fresh tooth, so um, this whole thing has been a very multi-collaborative effort. Um, and with that, um, I guess I'm gonna finish and take any questions you guys might have. You know, that's a really good question. So I do. Um, I've had trouble thinking about how I ask for that and like not get everything confused. So I do. I think it would be great because it would control for some genetic background issues. But you know, we try to, to, to deal with that by getting way more biological replicates than we need. Um, but I think it would be great. I would love to find a way. We could probably find a way to do it. Yes. Keep them paired. Yes. Mm -hmm. I can. I will use anybody's teeth. So we already have, we have one imprinting defect line. It just isn't going in these studies. But um, really, you know, we run a repository for dental pulp stem cells for all these syndromes. So the, the reason that it would be great to get her tooth is because there are other people who probably want to work on that and will have in hand like four or five DPSC lines ready to go. So it's really 
the best way to go. We'll, we're definitely interested. Mm -hmm. Because they don't always grow, unfortunately, or sometimes they'll be contaminated. Or so, yeah, we have we have a system in the lab. We just it's A and B and C for the same number. Yeah. Where'd it come from? That's a good question. I oh, it's from blood. Blood can be difficult. Yeah, it's like I don't know what I would do with that. And, and, and the upfront cost in doing RNA-seq is enough that it, we're not at that point yet. <laughs>